Hi everyone and welcome to the October edition of Cybar. So once again we're coming to you virtually, which I think actually for tonight's talk it's quite appropriate. But before I get to that, um, I'm just going to give a quick overview for anyone new that's joining us um, about what tonight is about and how it will work. So Cybar is our monthly event um, from Palace of Science in which we get a scientist or researcher based in the northeast of England to come and talk to us very informally about the work that they do. So every month we have a different speaker um, from a totally different topic. And the goal of this event, um, actually the goal of all Palace of Science events, is to showcase the science and research that's happening in the Northeast, and importantly, to get the um, public engaged with that. So you don't need a scientific background to enjoy any of these events. Um, hopefully you'll get to learn a little bit about some of the mass um, of wonderful science and research that's happening in the Northeast. So we started hosting these events online back in April um, when the lockdown started. Obviously, we could no longer do it in person. Um, and since then, every speaker has been really kind, um, allowed us to record every one of their talks. So if there's anything that you have missed since April that you would like to catch up on, you can find that on the Palace of Science YouTube channel. Um, and that goes for tonight's talk as well. Um, in a couple of days, it will be uploaded and you can watch it again if you wish. So the talk tonight will last about half an hour. And then we will take a five minute break so we can all refresh our glasses. Um, here at Palace of Science, we think hydration is very important. Um, and after that, we will then come back for a question and answer session with the speaker. So if you do have any questions for the speaker during the talk or at the break, then you can just stick them into the chat bar um, at the side and we will come to them at the end. Um, additionally, in that chat bar, periodically, hopefully, you will see um, a link appearing that has been shared by uh, some of the Palace of Science team. Um, we are asking if you have a spare couple of minutes, if you would like to provide us with some feedback about tonight's event. Um, this is really important. Um, it's really tricky for us, particularly virtually, to be able to gauge whether you're enjoying the event or not. Um, so this is really useful for us and particularly for me to organise events in the future to know if you actually enjoyed um, the ones we've been hosting. And as a little incentive for you, if you do provide some feedback, um, we will be picking a name at random. And that person will be sending some lottery tickets to. So as you may or may not know, Palace of Science is now a member of One Lottery. And this is a lottery platform specifically for charities and for not-for-profit organisations like ourselves. And they have a prize draw every week of £25,000. Um, so if you fill in the feedback form, you have a chance to win some tickets to that. Or you can, of course, buy tickets um, if you go to One Lottery and you can select Palace of Science um, as the donor if you would like to support our cause. So all of our events are free, but unfortunately it does cost us to host them. Um, so any support would be massively appreciated. So I'll be back after the talk to give you a bit more information about us. But for now, I think we'll move on to the main event. So the topic for tonight's talk, I think, is really fitting. At the moment, I think we can all really appreciate um, that novel ways of communicating and educating ourselves as a result of the pandemic um, is really important. Our speaker tonight is a Marie Curie researcher in the School of Engineering at Newcastle University. And she's going to talk to us about some of the work she does um, as part of a larger European group um, using gameplay and virtual reality as an educational tool. So if you could all give a very warm welcome, um, Dr. Choma Udozo. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, thank you guys for tuning in today. My name is Choma Udozo. I am yet to be a doctor, Nicola. <laughs> I'm a PhD researcher at Newcastle University. And I'm looking at the use of games um, for chemical engineering education. So today my talk will be about generally about the, how games are being used for, for education in general without necessarily um, chemical engineering. Uh, today's talk will cover two broad aspects. One will be, I'll be discussing what game is and why the interest in game for learning. And the second aspect of uh, my talk would cover some of the 
evidence-based benefits that has been reported with the use of games for learning. So, what is a game? Currently, there are about 2.5 billion gamers worldwide, and it is predicted that the game industry is going to surpass the film industry in terms of revenue by the end of this year. So generally, what is a game? We all play game. A game is described as a structured form of play, usually undertaken for, for fun. And there are different kinds of games. There are the board games that are non-digital games and the digital games. But thanks to advances in technology, there is a lot of emphasis on digital games and what they can offer us. Games can be played on different platforms, different digital platforms. You can play your games on your phone. You can also play it on um, an ARO device, augmented reality games, as well as virtual reality games. And the level of immersion in this different platforms differ with augmented reality and um, virtual reality offering a higher sense of presence in the environment. So for those who have experienced virtual reality, you know that your entire environment is virtual and you find yourself immersed in it. So when you put on your goggle or the headset, everything around you is not real. It's just a simulated environment and you can easily interact with this environment as if you are in it. So the higher the level of immersion, usually the better the experience. So the, game exp the gaming experience or a learning experience, whichever it is, and inherently, the better the learning. Um, sorry, the, pe the better the learning outcome that comes from it. So next, what makes a game? There are different kinds of games. We have action games, which is the shooting games that many of us are aware of. The role-playing games, where people take the roles of, you know, the, take um, the roles of different um, people and you know, play out with your roles, assuming you're a doctor and a patient in a hospital trying to uh, play out those roles and see how what happens. And then fin um, finally, the simulation game, which is very common when it comes to training and for education. A number of things um, are common among games and a number of things are, are classified as characteristics of games. What makes a game? So rules, games usually have sets of rules that you have to abide to. And there is usually a goal or goals that you're looking at. And most times, good game, many good games have narratives or storyline. And there is always an aspect of competition, either with yourself or with non-playing characters within the game environment, or even with other people in multiplayer games. And there is challenge, which is very important because that's what keeps people going. If the challenge, if there is no challenge, there will be no um, motivation to play the game. But when there is challenge, everybody tries to, all the players try to, you know, achieve this one and get to the next stage. And there is feedback and a game has to be either a single player game or a multiplayer game. So what is, how do we then use games for learning and what is the whole idea of the use of game for learning? Actually, there is a term for it. It's called game-based learning. And when digital games are involved, it's known as digital game-based learning. So game-based learning is an instructional method that involves the integration of educational content within game environment. And generally, so far, both entertainment games and educational games have been used for, for, for learning purposes. Entertainment games are the over the, the, the um, sorry, off the shelf games, the ones we can easily find and buy. And educational games are games that have been designed specifically for educational purposes. <laughs> sorry, for educational purposes. And although these two different kinds of games are, are being used for, for learning purposes, the, there are benefits and challenges with with the use of them. So for off-the-shelf game, for instance, uh, they are usually high design games, you know, with good, good visuals and good aesthetics that makes it interesting for people to play and engaging. 
and the use of this game could be very cheap or could be cheaper, relatively cheaper than designing a game specifically for learning. However, the challenge with using a commercial of the shelf games that have been designed for entertainment purposes or for fun is that they usually come with complex interfaces because they are appealing to the eye and there are lots of fantasy and lots of elements that make it interesting to play this game. They could also cause, um, increase the cognitive load of learners. So uh, when teachers try to teach, they try to make things simple and removing distractions from it. So most of these games come with a lot of distractions, making it difficult for people to learn from it. Additionally, the steep learning curve comes with it. <laughs> the steep learning curves that come with um, learning through entertainment games. They are not designed to teach, so it might be difficult to, for, for different learners on different capa uh, with different capabilities to, to engage with the game and to learn from it. And finally, there's a mismatch between um, game between what's in the game and what is expected or the learning outcomes in the curriculum. Educational games are games designed specifically for learning. Usually there's a clear link between what the game is about and uh, the curriculum outcome, making it simpler for, for educators to use this kind of game. However, there are challenges with the use of educational game. One is design challenge because they are not, most of the AAA companies don't, they don't focus on designing games for, for learning. They, they, they focus on designing games for fun. It's usually difficult for teachers to, to design their own game. They require expertise of the teacher as well as the game designer. And this could be expensive and time consuming. Mm, uh, making it, you know, impractical or difficult for, for, um, for teachers to use educational games in every, every setting. And finally, educational games may fail to engage. So one thing that's one big aspect of games that make them interesting or, and that, are, that is causing a lot, bringing a lot of interest into it is the fact that games are motivating. People play them without being told to play. People play them as if they're trying to win something from it. But generally, it's for satisfaction, you know, inherent satisfaction that they get from it. And when you design a game that has a lot of um, learning, um, with a lot of learning content in it, and which might affect the fun part of it, this might fail to engage students and inherently fail to, to deliver the expected um, outcome. So why the interest in game-based learning or the, the interest in the use of games for learning? One major, Reason in many literature is the fact that games are intrinsically motivating. So people play them for no other reason other than for the enjoyment and the satisfaction they get from it. And now having educational content within this environment that will allow students to enjoy the process and have a sense of autonomy and other psychological needs of general humans, sense of um, competency and relatedness, will make it, will definitely improve the way people learn and even increase the outcomes from, from every learning content. Secondly, games are engaging. People play for long, forgetting everything that's happening within their environment. So if this quality is also embedded in the learning environment or the, the classroom environment, students will be able to engage with their learning content for longer than you know, the traditional textbook than they do with the traditional textbook and other learning materials. Games are adaptive. So there is usually the, you know, the easy, medium, and um, the expert or the high or the difficult levels, as well as different levels of game. This is exactly how, how um, teaching is done. You start building on from what people already know and increasing the difficulty or the complexity and they learn from it. So game provides this avenue, this opportunity to do the same. And then an important, another important aspect is instant feedback. Feedback enhances learning. So if one is able to get personalized feedback in terms of, in, in terms of hints or even trophies or rewards, they're able to know how well you're doing 
and probably what they are supposed to do to, you know, scale a difficult level or to even improve generally with the expected outcome. So, what do games offer? I don't know, do you know that the average time it takes or the average time span that students um, are engaged in the traditional le lecture room, listening to lectures and paying attention is the first 10 to 15 minutes. And for, for, for classes that are like three hours long, imagine that just the first 15 minutes are usually the time that students are engaged in, in, in all the sense of it with, with the lecturer or the, the class activity. And this form of learning where we talk, where the teacher is just in front of you, spilling out knowledge, is called, it's all usually referred to as the passive learning. And active learning, which is the opposite, learning by doing, taking, participating in the learning activity, is believed to enhance learning more than passive learning. And what games offer is the opportunity for students to take part, to, to, you know, to interact with the environment, to build on something or to even evaluate something and make sense of it, you know, like construct their own knowledge from it. I, I recently I was using um, a game called Cosmic Link Game, a recycling game, to introduce first-year chemical engineering students into the principles of um, separation operation, which is a module in chemical engineering. And this game builds on the knowledge students already have on different concepts, material properties, such as you know, density and um, temperatures, and not, uh, temperature, well, boiling, boiling temperatures, um, what else, magnetic properties and all that. They build on this knowledge to see how they can, and see how it is applied in a recycling plant. This form of learning, even without giving a classroom, a face-to-face -face classroom, students can already learn from it. They can make mistakes and, you know, learn from their mistakes and see how things are applied to a new um, environment. And for operators training, they've seen that using games or using simulation games, for instance, to train operators has been more effective than telling them to sit down and listen to your PowerPoint presentation, for instance. Additionally, 21st century skill is something that has been talked about, the skills for tomorrow, even for today. And these skills are usually difficult to teach. They are better developed, and there is no better way to do this than the use of technology and interactive technologies where people can collaborate, people can think critically, people can create, and even to, to also enhance their communication skills. Another um, important aspect or another thing that game offer us is problem-based learning. So imagine having a game where things are not right. As a chemical engineer, we work with plants, plant processes, where you have to you know, um, uh, process raw crude and turn them into petrol, um, diesel and all that, and you bring a, a plant layout in a form of a game to, to students. A plant that has that is faulty or that isn't operating uh, as it should, and give them this thing the opportunity to to evaluate what's the problem within this environment and also give feedback. I believe it's 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 a better it's a better way to you know have students apply their knowledge and also show how much they know than asking them to write it down. And this is, these are all what people can, all what game offer for, for education. And we all know we make mistakes in games. You fail a level, you start again. Fail, um, games offer the opportunity to fail gracefully with little or no consequence, and then gives people the opportunity to be curious, to, to, to take risks, and then you know, build on their creativity and innovation. In a chemical plant, I always use the example of the chemical industry because that's what I'm very used to. Uh, things can go very, very wrong. You can have explosions, you can have um, fires and even chemical spillages that can, that can cause like serious damage. In such environment, it is difficult to, you know, to, to learn or to practice within that environment because of safety reasons or concerns. But 
having an environment, a virtual environment where this whole thing can be replicated and those consequences also um, can be felt, but not in the same degree. Students have the students, it offers more opportunity for students to learn by doing and to, to learn in the uh, have authentic learning experience without the without the worries of you know without worrying for safety. It is also cheaper, relatively cheaper to use games, um, virtual ga or virtual simulations for for learning. For, for instance, for your lab work in the current situation where um, the pandemic has made it difficult for face-to-face -face classes. So instead of having um, students coming to the campus, maybe three students at a time, and now having the lecturer spill this over a, a couple of weeks, virtual or, or you know, virtual reality labs or augmented reality labs can be made available to students and they sit in their homes and take part in the lab activities and do the, um, the necessary activities required and take the test or whatever assessment that is required. So games offer cost benefit as well. Now, we've talked about the different things that game offer us and, um, and why the interest in game. Now I will share some of the you know, evidence-based benefits of, of using digital games for learning based on literature. So one of the biggest benefits or one of the biggest motivation to use game, <laughs> okay, motivation, one of the biggest rationale to use game is that it increases motivation to learn. So it is something that has been researched and has been researched to see if it actually uh, increases the motivation to learn compared to the current traditional way we learn. And many studies have shown that, yes, that the use, students who use game to learn are usually um, spend more time on those learning material, which is now the game, compared to students who are given textbooks, for instance, or um, other computer-based uh, materials. And students who use game always report, reported higher enjoyment of the experience compared to the other students. And a colleague of mine conducted a meta-analysis looking at the various studies that have used games for chemistry education and have also um, assessed motivation during this period. And I've seen that there is a significant difference between um, students who used game in, the, in terms of motivation between students who used game for learning chemistry and those who were taught the traditional way. And generally, it's worth noting that motivation increases if students are motivated to learn, they are more likely to spend more time on this material, on, on, they're more likely to spend time learning, as well as the achievement is usually greater than when they are not motivated, you know, to take part in that activity. So in addition to motivation, another thing that um, research is trying to, you know, find out and to make sure it's true is that this game environment, do they help in knowledge and skills acquisition or is it just all about fun? And several studies have compared, you know, different groups, group of students who use digital games and those who use um, board games, for instance, so students who use textbook and other, um, you know, other computer-based materials and those who used game. And many of them have found out that they're, that's, that both students, there was actually um, knowledge gain or skills acquisition with the use of game. Um, factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge gains have been reported. Good hand-eye coordination has also been reported, particularly for, subject, for um, those in the medical school trying to become surgeons. They use it for training, as well as multitasking skills. Uh, a class, sorry, um, a study that was conducted in Italy not so long ago followed this um, particular step, you know, divided students into two groups. One group used the game to learn, the other group used, computer -based, used other computer-based activities such as um, PowerPoint presentation and Excel. And before they were given, they were split into these groups, they all took, you know, a test usually called pre-tests, um, pre those that are taken before an intervention. And then after spending an hour and a half 
on their learning, uh, on, on their group activity, in their individual activity, but in two different groups. They also took a post test. What the study found was that, you know, at the beginning, before, um, before they played the game or took part in the other activity, students had similar um, knowledge or similar competences. But after playing the game, it increased for both of them, generally, both for the game group and the um, control group. And for the game group, it was actually a little bit higher, but nothing significant. But what this tells us is that knowledge can actually be gained through games. You know, you could learn something through games and maybe you could even learn more. But that conclusion we can draw from this because there were just 60, um, 62 participants. Another thing is, can we retain knowledge learned in game? Is it, are students able to retain it for longer or is it just learn it at that point and as soon as the game is over, it's all gone? Studies have shown that yes, that after a, 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 after a couple of days or even weeks of playing a game, students can actually um, retain that knowledge. They can remember what they've learned and they can even apply it. One study used um, a virtual reality game to teach aviation safety. And one week later, they tried to, they, they, they did another test. So the stood, people were grouped into two. Some did the traditional safety um, classes while the others were given virtual reality games to play. And a week later, they were called back, you know, to take a test. And surprisingly, those who did the virtual reality game did exceedingly better than those who took the traditional uh, method. And one, and the traditional method isn't isn't immersive. You know, it's it, it's it's a paper it's a paper pencil thing. And one um, one reason that was given for for this difference in in um, outcome after a week long um, was the immersion in this the immersive experience with virtual reality. So for those who took the virtual reality part of the, the, the training, they, they had their, you know, their head-mounted devices on and it felt like they were in, in, in a plane you know, with all the accidents and you know, trying to fix their belt and doing those activities. So it's, it's led to a more difficult to forget memory you know, experience and they were able to recall it even long, for longer. Another one is transferability. Uh, the knowledge acquired within game environment, are you able to transfer them to real world environment? And the answer is yes. This, the, the chat below is actually a study that was conducted with from, um, by one of my colleagues in Germany. She's working with plant operators in a chemical plant. And now they're trying to use, you know, to, to check whether using virtual reality um, simulation of this plant could enhance learning as much as using the pilot plant. So they have a pilot plant, they have the virtual reality um, plant. And on the first day, student, the, the apprentices were, were split into two groups. Some used the pilot plant to learn, while the others were given the virtual reality um, simulation game to learn. And on the very first day when this um, training was done, both of them, both both groups had similar competences. So they had similar amount, they made similar amounts of mistakes during that training. And then three days later, they were all called back, now not in the virtual reality, um, not to the virtual reality plant, but to the main plant, the pilot plant, which is a physical plant. And now they were asked to repeat the same thing that they did the last time. And from the graph, you can see that those in the pilot plant made much more mistakes than those in the virtual reality plant. So those in the virtual reality plant, those who use the virtual reality plant on the first day had um, a, a better retained the knowledge they gained than the other group. And they were able to also transfer it from a virtual environment to a real environment. So what this says in general is that knowledge, the tag, knowledge can also or can be acquired in the game environment or using game. And this knowledge can be transferred so, you know, to a real world environment and probably can be even retained longer than, you know, the other, other forms of learning. And finally, another big aspect of um, 
game-based learning, uh, or another big um, benefit that has been reported is better learning experience for students. So, I, I, one of my first um, study where I, I, I checked students' perceptions towards was digital games for chemical engineering education. So I asked students, why do you, do you think it's a good idea to use games for learning and, and why? And many of them came up with different things, all pointing out to, you know, better learning experience, you know, realistic learning, better visualization of, you know, difficult to imagine concepts and immersion in the environment with authentic learning. So in general, and we know that um, with Better experience in anything always leads to better effectiveness in that. And with all we've said about uh, digital games and the use of these games for learning, there are also challenges. It's not all rosy. And the fact that digital game-based learning is fairly new also poses a number of challenges that are yet to be dealt with. But one, um, it's not, it's not new that there is, there's a problem of addiction with entertainment games, as well as violent tendencies uh, for players who, who play these games. Studies have shown that true, but recent studies have looked at the long-term effect of, and saw that there was really none, um, no long-term effect on, or, or of addiction and violence on, on the players. However, it is worth noting that it's something... Um, it's something practitioners and teachers who use these games should also consider when using them. And um, for educational games, so games designed specifically for education, my opinion is that it, it, it's the problem of addiction and violence might, might not necessarily be the case for educational games. But usually these games are designed with specific things in mind. They would not necessarily design them to be violent. And they are usually designed as mini games, very small, short-lived games that are with the intention to teach maybe a particular concept and usually take a few levels. So you, you can't play it for too long. You, you, there's always there's a limit to how much you can play. And repetition is not always something that every, anybody fancies. So using educa educational games, um, the problem of addiction and violence might, might not be experienced with that. However, for digital game-based learning, that is using games for learning, there are different problems. One is acceptance and adoption. Although many of the students who are currently in schools are considered as, a, as digital natives, so they've, they've had digital devices or they've, they've you know, experienced it right from the birth, right from when they were born or when they were very young. Even at that, not every student um, is open to using something they play for fun, for something more serious. And this could affect the way they use it and eventually affect its effectiveness. Additionally, teachers are also a big, um, having teachers accept it and use it is also a big challenge. Because some, some teachers aren't very welcoming of technology and for obvious reasons. And if, it's, if we are unable to get everybody on board, it will just be a waste and, you know, it, 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 won't, it will amount to very little. So the problem of um, acceptance and adoption is still there. It's trying to convince students as well as teachers that game is, is actually effective for learning and it's good for learning. And coming to effectiveness, a number of reasons might make games or the use of games um, you know, not, not effective for, for, for learning. Things like learning style. Some people might not just want it, might not just, you know, see the need for it. And this will affect how they use it and eventually affect um, how much they gain from it. And all those, also those with different disabilities might also be excluded from using games. Additionally, the whole concept of motivation might differ for different groups. So for motivation, whenever we talk about motivation, the big, the big thing that comes up is enjoyment, you know, the sense of enjoyment, sense of fun. But for adults and young learners, this might not be the case. For young learners, maybe fun is, might be an intricate part of their, um, 
intention to use uh, use um, games for learning. But for adult learners, this might not be the case. In my recent discussion with a group of students, uh, chemical engineering students, second and third years, I asked them if um, what they th what they make of game and what do they expect from a game that would be given to them to learn. And fun never came up. Enjoyment never came up. But one thing that kept resounding was that is it does it actually help them learn? Is it effective? Is it aligned to their learning goals and their learning journey? So for, for, for motivation is something that also has to be um, taken into consideration. What motivates um, the group of students you're trying to use games for? And um, what, you, what the motivation also, how does it play out? Also, um, there is also a problem of gender differences in the way in game use or game play. We know that boys, we have more gamers who are, who are boys than girls. And a number of these games have been designed to you know, attract, the, the, attract boys more than girls. So if, um, if a, an instructor or a teacher decides to use a game without taking into consideration gender differences in the way people play game or even enjoy game, some group of students might be excluded from the activity and eventually um, the entire outcome that's expected from, from the game might be lost or might not be achieved. How do we integrate and use games for learning? It's an unconventional teaching method. That means we, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not what we're used to. So asking the teacher to use it, how would this teacher use it? Will he or she deploy the game before um, teaching or in the middle of the, uh, of the classroom activity or even after as a take-home assignment. These are things that, um, that we haven't yet figured out, the instructional methods. These are things that we haven't yet figured out and that needs to be addressed to ensure that you know, um, game-based learning goes smoothly and people actually achieve what is expected. And design consideration. I've talked about designing an educational game. It requires the expertise of uh, a, a content um, or, you know, of a teacher who, who is an expert in a particular subject and the game designer. And it takes time, it takes effort, and it's expensive. So how do we address these this things and how do we make, you know, games more global and more aligned to, to many curriculum and not just us to ensure that, you know, the time and effort spent on this can is worth it. And then finally, assessment. How do we assess learning in game? Is it is it going to be like having someone go to a driving school, you know, and take part in the driving, the, the real life driving, and bringing him or her back to a classroom and giving them a multiple choice question to answer? It's not aligned. It's it's it, game is like it's it's an action. It's so performance assessment. How do you how do you measure those things? These are things that we are looking into and that still has to be researched to make sure that the use of game is, is wholesome and it's effective. Now, to conclude from all the things I've been saying, games are effective for learning. That is one thing I, I can assure you. They, they, they have proven to, to, to help people learn better or to enhance um, knowledge acquisition. And secondly, they can also enhance longer retention of skills and knowledge learned. So things learned within game environment might even be remembered for longer compared to, you know, things you learned from reading a book. And the use of games for learning will differ for different groups, for, the, for adults versus children and for male versus female users. And this should be taken into consideration when, when deploying games for, for learning. And no, games are not better than uh, conventional teaching methods. Games can only complement them because the, the place of a teacher cannot be taken up by game. So games can act as a complement to the existing pedagogical methods or tools that we have. And finally, additional research is required in various aspects of game-based learning to make sure that um, we figure everything out. So um, thank you very much for listening. 
My project is funded by the EU and I'm based in Newcastle University. That's a link to our, our web page where you can see lots of information about on game-based learning. There are 15 of us doing this research and we are you know, looking at various aspects of it and you might find something interesting. And you can also look us up at different social media using Charming H2020. Thank you. Over to you, Nicola. Nicola. Thank you, Choma. That was really interesting. Um, so one thing I've certainly picked up that you made clear is being engaging um, and having active learning is really important for people to absorb information. Um, and luckily, we thought about this in advance. And for our audience, we have um, created a quiz, a game-based quiz for you to do at the break that we're just about to go on. Um, so you can look forward to that. Just before we have that break, I will just remind you, if you do have any questions um, for Choma, we'll be back after the break for a question and answer session. Please do put them into the chat box and we will cover them. Um, additionally, this... Oh, now I have to remember what I was going to tell you. Sorry. Um, this talk um, has been recorded. Um, very uh, Choma very kindly allowed us to record it and it will be added to the Palace of Science YouTube channel in a couple of days. So if there's anything you missed and you want to watch again, um, you can find it there along with all of our previous talks. If you have to dash off, um, you should know that we have next month's Cyber um, is organised for the 25th of November. It's another researcher from Newcastle University, um, but on a slightly different topic. Um, so it's Dr. Chris Howell talking about the chemistry of coffee. So I'm sure you're all familiar with coffee and um, some really interesting stuff he's going to talk about then. That's on the 25th of November. Remember, if you want to leave us any feedback about tonight's event, then there will be a link appearing in the chat box that you can follow and you might be entered into a draw to win some lottery tickets. Um, if you don't win any lottery tickets, but you do want to buy some, you can go to one lottery and you can select Palace of Science as your donor cause. Um, and you might be um, in with a shot of winning a £25,000 prize um, when we do our draw in December. Um, so I think that's everything from me for now. Um, obviously, we have the Palace of Science webpage and we are on social media if you want any more information. Um, but now we're going to take a five minute break and then be back for a question and answer session. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we'll get started with the question and answer session. Um, I'll I'll just put in a little caveat. Choma, we know you have someone to put to bed very soon. Um, so we'll keep this short, but we do have some questions for you before you go. Um, so I'll just dive right in. So the first one, um, in terms of the, the gameplay, how might these technologies provide new opportunities for disadvantaged learners, for example, those who might not have access to further or higher education? Okay, I think um, one thing that game environment, uh, you know, brings to the table is the ability to simulate lab, um, labs, to simulate, um, you know, real environment, and for people who don't have access to this environment, so, maybe for, for various reasons, they can sit in their home and even on their phone and, you know, take part in the, in the, in the activity and learn from, from this environment. So it provides a whole lot of opportunity. The, the biggest issue is creating the content, you know, creating it and deploying it. That's the biggest issue. Otherwise, if, when everybody has a mobile phone, some sort, or every family, at least you will see uh, a mobile phone and, this could easily be deployed to areas where they, they lack some of the, um, you know, some of the facilities that are required for, for learning. Yeah, definitely. You actually touched on um, a point I wanted to ask in terms of um, delivery for this sort of stuff. I mean, who would do it? I'm thinking in a, a higher education setting, particularly at the moment, I know a lot of people that are teaching students um, 
in the COVID crisis are having to move a lot of their teaching online. And I know um, from personal experience from my colleagues, it's added a lot of stress to what already is quite a really busy and stressful time trying to prepare all those materials and get them up to a, a state where they can be delivered online. So in terms of delivering this in different courses, who how would it be done? Would it be the, the teachers, the lecturers themselves that would have to learn it? Um, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. Yeah, it, it it's it shouldn't be it shouldn't be left for the teachers alone. It's 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 too much. It's beyond what they can do. They they are experts in the in the field, you know, in the content knowledge, but not in that design in the game design knowledge. So it's usually a collaborative effort between those who are content experts and those who are design experts. So yeah. So do do you think it would um, lead to another sort of area? Maybe even job creation, people yes. specifically creating educational Definitely, games. definitely. It's a, um, the game design, you know, um, more, the degrees are becoming very popular. And with this, with students in this, uh, you know, graduates coming out with, with knowledge in this, they could be recruited into the university environment or school environment. And they also help facilitate you know, game design for different different faculties and different schools. Yes, it's definitely lead to a new area. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense with you saying that the the gaming industry might overtake the film industry. Yeah, That's it's really surprising. It's, it's, yeah, I suppose the pandemic probably hasn't helped though. Yeah, it, <laughs> well, it would probably film. help. It would yeah. probably help the game industry more than it would the film industry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, another question we have. Do you think video games outperform teachers as a learning resource? Does game-based learning help to exercise uh, resilience in learners, e.g. if they fail, they can try and try again, um, whereas in a classroom, you can't really do that if you're being taught something from a teacher. It's sort of a set amount of time. Yeah, I, um, you know, there is an, an, an aspect of learning or of teaching and learning that games really compensate so for the lect for the teachers, they have a vital p- role to play, you know, in delivering this content. You don't just throw out a game. You have to structure it in a way that students will learn what you expect them to learn. You know, the learning outcome should be tailored to whatever learning activity you're doing. So it doesn't replace the teacher. It's not better than the teacher, but obviously it offers a new a new opportunity for students who are not able to, you know, take risks in classroom or ask questions. They can do it in the comfort of their house, make mistakes, you know, fail and get up again and try different things and end up even learning better in, in that environment. Yeah. Do you think um, game-based learning favors any particular subjects other than other? <laughs> I'm trying to think of ones I know of. I know things like. Uh, space travel they use a lot of uh, virtual and augmented reality to try and train yeah. for stuff I presume alien attack and things like that <laughs> I'm sure NASA does that yeah <laughs> for, for... Oh, um, <laughs> surgery based I think they use things yeah. like that for yeah. medical students yes so for training so there are two aspects for education and for training for education it's mainly you know the the conceptual understanding of things and for training are usually the procedural skills like trying to train in a, a surgeon uh, or training a pilot or you know training an operator in a plant so yeah for it depends at the one one very um, common place I've seen one aspect that I've seen where game is commonly used or have been used a lot is on language learning um, but yeah for I think it's there is always potential for different places to learn you know different um, modules in it or different um, degrees, for instance, there is opportunity. It's now tailoring whatever you're building within the game to fit the purpose. Fit the purpose. I can't say there is any a, any specific um, discipline where it suits better. Yeah. Well, that bodes well. We have um, someone in the audience um, that is actively looking for something uh, VR field trip or games. Um, specifically related to natural sciences, marine, freshwater, wildlife or agriculture, um, but looking for game designers to collaborate with. So if you have any, (laughs) can offer any help or any resources, certainly if you you want to share it with Palace of Science, we can pass this along. Uh, Yeah, I would would look into it and see. My colleagues who are designing games are currently, you know, 
drowning in work, so I, I can't really <laughs> say, but I'll look out to see if I find any, I'll let you know and you put it up on, on the website. Do you think um, any particular style of game is better suited? Um, you mentioned things like uh, role play. I immediately thought of sort of action games, chemistry, you get a sword and you break down <laughs> compounds. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not a gamer. <laughs> I don't know if that's coming across. <laughs> I think simulation game lays itself very well for, for learning and training because you are depicting a real life environment in a virtual environment. So you're bringing everything that is that you can find in a real environment, but putting it in a virtual environment. So and that's it's been used a lot for you know surgical training, for training pilots, for learning procedural skills and all that. So yeah, it's it's especially for higher higher learners, you know, for adult learners who are it, simulation games work best for them. But for younger ones, you could use the action game puzzles and all that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, using game learning will work better for people that have um, distinct learning styles or preferences? Uh, yeah, it, it, it won't favor everyone eventually. Um, people who don't play game wouldn't want to use game to learn. Um, or they might because maybe they, 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 they've been given a reason to play the game, you know. But yeah, it wouldn't. I'm sure it wouldn't favor everyone. Just like you know, some some learning activities don't favor everyone for for obvious reasons. It wouldn't favor everyone, but a majority of people it would favor, especially the, the the generations who are in the generation who are in school at the moment. They are regarded as digital natives. They are you know younger ones, uh, and many of them play games. Many of them, so it would favor a lot more than we know. Yeah. I suppose the idea is if you can develop it, it's just another tool that people yes. can use to improve their educational experience. Yeah. Um, someone is asking, which video game do you think has the best learning gameplay? <laughs> For what subject? <laughs> oh, <laughs> they haven't specified. <laughs> um, there, I, 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 can't, I can't say for sure, but there are lots of um, educational games for math, you know, that you can even use for very young children, for mathematics learning, for language learning. You just have to Google it and you would find, you would find it. I, I don't have anyone at the top of my head at the moment. So for the research you do, have you, do, do you have any games that you use? Yes. Do you find any? Yes. Uh, I didn't design any at the moment. So it, the previous European research that, that was just concluded, I think, last year, they designed a game for teaching recycling operation. It's called Cosmic Clean Game. So I think if you check cosmicclean.eu or something, you might be able to find it. It's it's a game that teaches, you know, that exposes people to the concept of recycling and how different materials can be recycled and how their properties, for instance, their particle size or density and all that <clears throat> could affect what kind of separator you use for it and how you even sequence you know, different separators to separate a mixture of several things, glass, uh, metal, and all that. Yes, there's a game. That's um, certainly not a, the first subject I would have thought about in terms of um, teaching using gameplay, but <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, in your view, uh, oh, sorry, what is your view of semi-interactive frameworks, which are more um, narrative-driven? such as uh, Berlin Blitz by the BBC. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, no. I, no? <laughs> I, 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 no, I haven't. I'm not familiar no. with it. No. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, yeah. You've obviously got to put someone to bed. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any more questions, um, is there anywhere they can contact you? Is it best to go to the, the Charming website? No, uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Same name, Chioma Odeoso, you can easily drop me um, a message there on the Charming website. You can drop a message, but it doesn't come to me directly. It comes to the website manager. But on LinkedIn, I'm available. My email address, chioma.odeoso at newcastle.ac.uk. Excellent. And if you if you have any um, future work that you'd like to share, um, we'd be happy to share that as well. So I'm just going to end on one last question. What is your favorite game? Super Mario. <laughs> nice. 
Nice. Very good. <laughs> that yeah. is correct. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was really thank interesting. You, Nicola. Thank you, um, And I think, yeah, our audience um, very actively engaged there. So that's good. Well done. Thank you for uh, having me. Yeah. No problem. So um, just to end... Um, after that great talk, as I've said, it will be added to the Palace of Science YouTube channel if you want to watch it again. Um, you can catch up on all our previous talks as well. If you want to learn any more about what we do, um, you can follow us on all social media, um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and we have a web page as well with lots of other materials, such as um, blog posts from different scientists and researchers. Again, if you can fill out um, our feedback form, if you enjoyed tonight's event, or even if you didn't, please let us know and you'll be in with a chance of winning some lottery tickets. Um, or you can, of course, buy those lottery tickets and select Palace of Science as the donor from one lottery if you're interested. Um, and finally, we'll be back next month on the 25th of November. We'll hear from another researcher from Newcastle University and he'll be telling us about the chemistry of coffee. So hopefully you can join us then. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you next month.